I'll just click. I can't read that from there. Is that Neil Lemieux? There we go. The bottom? Hey, Chris, can you Neil hear us? Lemieux, yes. Is that Colin Hello, Chris. Person? I can hear you in. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Very Perfect. good. Yep. Beautiful. Oh, I know about Max. Make sure everyone's at Christmas. Is that for you? I am. I think they are. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Talbot. I'm a senior manager of engineering and construction with Equity Office Properties and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, on behalf of IFMA, I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar this morning entitled uh, Data to Insight. Um, as you may already know, IFMA is the only edu organization dedicated to helping facility management professionals, professionals excuse me, add more value to their organizations by providing them with support for their careers, access to best practices and benchmark information, a diverse mix of interactive events, and tools to help navigate the changing workplace. So please check out the IFMA Boston website to get more information on educational opportunities. And as well, I wanted to mention some upcoming events in June. Excuse me. Because we're not seeing the full screen. Oh, yeah, that's right. All right. All right, get out of that then. Oh, I, I don't. Just click oh. anywhere else. Click there. And then click there. So it will be bigger for everyone on the screen. There we go. There we go. Okay. Excuse me. So some upcoming programs that IFMA has uh, in June is the Workplace Violence, a proactive approach. Uh, it's on June 6th at 7.30 a.m. and that's for FMs only. On June 15th, we have our IFMA Boston Bowling Bonanza on June 14th at 5.50 and that's for members only. And on June 19th, there's the uh, 2018 IFMA Boston Golf Classic at the Red Tail Golf Club. Can't see my number. Oh, I switch slides. So on to today's webinar. Today's today's webinar is data to insight, um, and it's a it's a good sequel to a, a a webinar that we had on January 23rd called the Scoop on the Internet of Things. And at that time, we discussed the explosion of new technology, how it all interacts, and how data is collected, and basically that we're all participating in this data collection, whether we realize it or not, whether we have a Nest thermostat or an Apple Watch. And so today we're going to try to answer the question of, so, you know, we have all this data, now what do we do with it? So you have three panelists from various backgrounds who are, uh, have all embraced the use and, and, uh, and use of uh, new technology and harnessing big data. Um, before we get to them, I was wondering myself, uh, we have so many acronyms and catchphrases in our industry, but I wondered just what was the definition of big data. So I Googled it and this is what we found. So it's big data, extremely large data sets that may be analyzed computationally to reveal pattern, patterns, trends, and associations, especially related, relating to human behavior and interactions. And much IT investment is going towards managing and maintaining big data today. So why is this important to us? Some questions for facility managers in our profession. Um, what data is most important? Um, how should FMs interpret this data? What should FMs do with this data? How are other FMs going about analyzing data in their facilities? And does data really make a difference and improve operations? So to help us uh, answer these questions today, we have uh, our panelists. Uh, once again, I'm Wayne Talbot. I'm a senior engineer of, man of engineering and construction with Equity Office. I've uh, been in the industry about 30 years, uh, operating and maintaining uh, commercial office buildings. And so I'll ask uh, each of our panelists to um, introduce themselves, tell us a little about themselves, 
who they work for, what they do, how long they've been in the industry, et cetera. And I guess we'll start uh, from left to right with Fred Mazzaro. Hi, I'm Fred Mazzaro. I uh, am Associate Director of Trade Operations at Northeastern University. Um, I work, I run the trades groups. I have uh, the six uh, trade supervisors report to me and a staff of, uh, of 80 tradesmen. Uh, previously, I was with the Massachusetts Port Authority in their facilities department and prior to that in their aviation department as a uh, construction project manager. Peter Muto. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Muto. I'm director of facilities for Cell Signaling Technologies. Uh, I've been in the industry, geez, longer than I care to remember, probably 30 years. Um, prior to, uh, we are a biotech company on, uh, on the North Shore of Massachusetts. We have uh, two facilities uh, domestically, and we have a number of facilities internationally. Um, prior to here, uh, I worked at Goodrich Corporation, um, which is uh, now part of, uh, I think, United Technologies, if I remember correctly. And then prior to that, I worked in uh, manufacturing uh, for a company called Sanmina SCI. Uh, Chris Roberts, are you here? Hi, everyone. Yep, so Chris Roberts, so I'm the solution architect uh, for Schneider Electric within their smart building division. Um, so I've been working in building services and facilities for you know almost 17 years now. Um, you might tell from the accent, I, I'm not a native Bostonian, so a lot of the time I've spent working in the UK and abroad. Uh, I've been living in, in Boston now for around about six years. And I might add that, uh, Chris, if I'm not mistaken, you are joining us from... Brazil. Brazil today? I'm in South Sao Paulo this week, yep, for a smart smart building conference down in, in Sao Paulo. Oh, okay, well thank you. Well thank you all for joining. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know I would like to make this an interactive interactive session. So if you have questions, um, please uh, type them in or text them in. Um, I don't want to be the only one with questions, so so please join in. Um, one of the, the, the common themes from the white paper uh, that uh, I, I saw that could benefit our industry was in the area of preventive maintenance and, and work order management. So uh, when, when I read the white paper, I, I, I got a, a laugh out of, there was a comment in there from a gentleman, Chris Skillman, who contributed to that paper about remembering keeping track of work orders on the back of napkins. And uh, I don't really want to date myself, but I remember when I got into the industry, uh, we used to uh, do preventive maintenance on a, uh, what I think it was called a VZ card system. And basically it was just like flip charts that were all populated manually. And uh, so Fred, I want to start with you because I, I see the impressive uh, amount of, of real estate that your, your department manages, no matter how you slice it by buildings or, or square footage or, or faculty and staff. Um, and when I saw the number of work orders, the first thing I thought was, that's a lot of napkins. <laughs> so uh, I, I was wondering if you could talk about um, just where, uh, you know, how you used to do things. Um, and, uh, and, you know, now that you're, you, you've gone to a, a computerized maintenance and management system, just the positive effects that collecting this data has had on your operations and productivity and uh, what this data is allowing you to accomplish that maybe you weren't able to accomplish previously? Actually, our the old, older word, I replaced, the system we replaced was an early version of Maximo. Um, it was implemented in the late 90s. Uh, the data was not consistently maintained, it had too many hands on it. Uh, so inconsistent, even though it sounds simple, inconsistent nomenclature, things like lower and upper case, uh, uh, misspellings, they may sound simple, but they made it impossible to create reports. So you really need strict rules and only certain dedicated staff that should have data onboarding and, and data maintenance access. A uh, new system, we're moving to an ARCABUS work order system and hopefully beyond that an ARCABUS integrated work management system uh, allows staff via electronic devices, iPad, iPhone, Surface Pros, uh, view the queue of work orders, prioritize and complete them both physically and electronically much faster than back and forth trips to our customer service office to pick up their paper work orders. So obviously that saves cost and productivity with the, with the, with the staff. 
uh, which was the paper method. Uh, it further allows our HVAC staff, which is typically the most calls in any large campus, uh, our office complex, our manufacturing facility, uh, to access the building automation systems, change set points, stop, start and stop equipment from virtually anywhere, anywhere they were, where they are. Um, work order completion sent, uh, emails are sent to each customer and surveys are kept, kept that we, we uh, distribute weekly and we're constantly in a state of improvement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you have uh, multiple sites and it seems maybe a, a little bit of a different industry sector from Fred or mine. And um, for instance, where I work in a, in a service of you know, commercial tenant base. So can you provide any insight into how a CMMS system has improved operations at, at your facilities? Um, yeah, certainly. So my story is somewhat similar to Fred's in that um, prior to us moving to our current um, software that we manage uh, work requests and preventive maintenance activities, we were working with a application called Facilities Desk. Um, and that became end of life for the manufacturer uh, from a tech support standpoint in 2009. So from 2009 to 2014, almost 15, we were using an application that was not supported. We pretty much the only thing we could do was receive, respond to work requests. I had to download the work request, work request history into an Excel and manipulate the data in order to get any kind of metrics, KPIs uh, that you would want to garner from that information uh, in a Excel format. We transitioned into a CAFM system. For us, one of the things that we want to do uh, was manage space as well as work requests uh, and preventive maintenance. So we transitioned into an application called FM Systems, Archibus and FM Systems. For us, we're, we're on our very short list, but we ended up choosing FM Systems. And what that application allows uh, myself and my staff to do is, you know, anywhere they need to work, um, they can. So it's very mobile. So they work on iPhones, they work on iPads, they work on laptops. Um, our customer base is, is fitted with laptops. So they can bring that in and really understand what their queue is and work that they need to perform. Um, from my perspective, uh, it really provides me some uh, deeper insight into how we operate, how many work requests we're getting, what type of work requests we're getting. Um, are we having a number of repetitive work requests uh, for similar or exactly the same activity in the same location? Uh, so at the end of the day, what this application was allowed us to do is to really manage uh, the way we support our customer base in a more efficient manner. Uh, we're able to ensure that our preventive maintenance activities are done on schedule. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, is space is a, a, is a big issue for us because we're a growing company. Um, our square footage is not nearly what uh, Northeastern has. We're, we're only about 230,000 square feet domestically and we're rapidly running out of space. So how we manage that is critically important. So this application has allowed us to really look at um, that's the space utilization opportunities that we have. Thank you, Peter. Chris, do you have anything to add from your perspective? I, I know the previous question was related to work order and or preventive maintenance. It seems like a no-brainer that any organization would benefit from um, to updating a, to a more advanced computerized system to keep you know, to update from keeping track of things on the back of napkins. But I found your comment in the white paper about knowing your problem, you were trying knowing the problem you were trying to solve before investing investing in it very interesting and could you expand on that yeah yeah I mean, sometimes when, when we look at it we sometimes we get obsessed by technology uh, and we can kind of lose uh, the insight as to you know what are our real challenges and problems that we're having in our day-to-day -day operations and facilities so a lot of the times you know when we're working with clients or discussing with them it's really getting back to the basics of understanding you know where is the improvement needed uh, or what are the challenges uh, within their systems and I think CMMS solutions are a great example of where you know traditionally you've had data sets um, siloed throughout that building and you can now start to aggregate all that information together so that you can have an easier way to plan your maintenance. One of the interesting things that we, we always find with that and you know Fred mentioned the, the HVAC systems is making sure that you know both of these systems um, are working with the same structure of data so that we don't get you know, lost in data when, you know, HVAC systems start to 
send certain alerts into the CMS. The last thing we want is to overload a system with, with data that's not useful. Thank you. So uh, I'm not sure just how to apply this question, and uh, maybe it'll expose me as not understanding big data as well as I should, but and uh, I think I'll uh, direct it to you, Fred, because uh, I know that in, in the white paper you said you're kind of down the road already in, in implementing some uh, a lot of different processes and procedures based on the data that you've collected and, and so forth. And do you have any any uh, concern at all that that data is flawed or that uh, it could be that it could change and that maybe it's led you led you down down a uh, down a down a path that maybe you may be going too far ahead of the data? And uh, and Chris, this might tie back to to your talking about knowing what the problem you were trying to solve is um, before taking the leap. I don't know if there's any. Um, any concern from the the, the users here who have uh, embraced this data on on that on that topic or or, or potential, if, even if it is a a, a, a concern? Well, 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 if not we are we are moving. Sometimes it's a little discouraging that we're moving slowly, but we're moving slowly so that we make sure we do process the right data. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on right now are service level agreements to publish for our community so that they can go right on our facility's website, see what type of, what, what we do, how we achieve it. Uh, say it's a, a carpentry shop and a broken window, our response time will, might be four hours, our completion time might be two days to repair it. Same thing with, uh, with any of the, the other uh, uh, everyday chores, uh, 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 you know, a, a breaker is down for the electrical department or something like that. So we're publishing these service level agreements and they'll, they'll have response times, they'll have uh, typical completion times, uh, you know, quality measures or what we, what we expect out of, from, for quality, um, costs if it's a chargeback type item, because if it's not maintenance, if it's a special request, like simply if, you're, if someone wants a shelf installed in their office, that would be a chargeback from our carpentry department. Or if someone wants a split system, a, a secondary air conditioner installed in their office, that, that would be a chargeback. So uh, typical charges for these type of items that are also on the site. So, uh, and then overall satisfaction. We have, um, with each completed work order, a survey is sent out to the individual, to the recipient, and they get to grade us. So we're using that data to move forward so that we know we're publishing the right things and telling the people what it is that we do and what they can expect from us from uh, so that we can load it all into our system. So I guess uh, Fred and Peter, for both of you, so have, have these systems, uh, uh, obviously how, how is upper management or the, the you know, your, your upper management received these and has it been, obviously it, it seems like it's been very favorable, but can you give some feedback on that? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so for us, um, I think it was somewhat of a hard sell for us to really get our C-level people to understand the benefits. Um, you know, if it's not broken, they don't really see the issues that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's hard to convince them to to make a, a solid business case that this is the right decision, especially when you're talking about um, software applications that are, you know, six digits. I mean, they're, they're very expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of integration with, you know, IT and, and training your staff and, and all the uh, miscellaneous items that go along with doing this kind of transition. However, now um, when I'm reporting on our performance and we're looking at our key performance indicators that we decided that we are going to at least start out with, um, it's it's night and day. They really see the value of what we're we're bringing to the to the table. So if our owner, we're a private company. If our owner comes to me and says, "Hey, how many single offices do we have open?" I can just either pull up my computer and show them, or I might even know off the top of my head. So we're small enough to be able to do that. In the past, I would have to say, "Well, I have to get back to you. I got to walk around the building. I got to do a head count." <laughs> um, where that information is now literally at my fingertips and. It makes a big difference when you're able to provide that information when they need it in a timely fashion. So that that is a been a huge benefit for us. Thank you, Chris. I, if I if I'm not mistaken, you may be kind of on on the other side of the the coin as someone who uh, puts together uh, uh, um, solutions uh, for people to to harness this data. And so, um, do you have 
do you see resistance initially from clients when you uh, for your services to to uh, to do this? And I know you work in primarily in the healthcare field, so maybe they're are they ahead of the curve? Maybe uh, ahead of the curve of, from in terms of um, as related as compared to you know more commercial based tenants or or, or operators. I I, th I think that they're probably um, relatively in the in the same position when we're discussing with. And, and just going back to the, the question of the kind of the, the flow of the picture, I think, you know, what we do find is, is data integrity um, is really the biggest challenge that we, we see in facilities and having that evidence-based fact uh, to go forward with the decision, you know, it was just mentioned. So what we do find with, with, most, with most facilities that we're working with, and, you know, particularly in healthcare, is that, you know, their, their decisions are, are based on hard facts, you know, when they're competing for, you know, costs in a facility to upgrade, say, an electrical system versus new, you know, imaging equipment. Um, the facility team are often overlooked. But having, you know, evidence-based decision and having accurate information is, is really important. It's, it's a good tool set um, to be able to help challenge the financial uh, decisions that are made in facilities. Thank you. Uh, you in, in the white paper, you, you uh, referenced, a, I thought it was a great story about um, an implementation where uh, a facility was able to uh, determine or, or, or predict a failure in a, in a, in a, a generator, I believe, before, before uh, they had a, a, a catastrophic failure. Um, could you talk about that a little? Yeah, sure. So, so it was actually a, a transformer that they had in, in their data center. And so it was a very large uh, healthcare campus. So obviously, you know, any outage of that data center is going to have, have quite a big impact on how patient care is delivered. Um, and they'd previously um, had a transformer which had actually exploded within their facility. Um, and they wanted to put measures in to prevent that from happening in the future. And I think, you know, with technology um, becoming a lot more um, cost competitive um, and a lot more in advanced, uh, we were able to, you know, install different types of sensors within, within inside of that transformer so that we could do continuous monitoring. And what we actually found is that um, during, you know, plant maintenance, um, because it's very subjective when the facility teams go around, is that the system, you know, on evidence of that day when they're doing their maintenance, it, it appears that it's working correctly. But what we actually were able to identify, you know, by collecting all this data continuously is that we were seeing a lot of, um, you know, pulses within that transformer. Um, and by analyzing that data, uh, we were able to identify it um, down to arcing of the windings within, within that equipment. You know, once we recommended them to do an oil analysis, um, you know, there was a potential for that transformer to actually explode because there was high levels of ethanol uh, within the oil type transformer. So, so that was an example of where we, you know, we provided them with clear evidence um, of a condition, you know, to do with, you know, the gas that was in that um, transformer as well as, you know, the arcing that we were seeing happen. And it wasn't happening at a, at a kind of um, regular, instance it was very uh, sporotic in terms of when that was happening so you would never pick that up um, through your regular maintenance regimes so for them you know they were able to avoid a huge um, outage within their uh, facility so it reduced their risk and it was really a you know win-win for the facility thank you fred uh peter do you have any any um instances like that are you seeing any data that that has brought um uh, something to your attention where something's going wrong, where you've been able to avoid um, a, a, a situation of equipment failure or, or anything like that, or do you feel that it's it's it's, it's helped um, helped you to to predict anything? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, I hear this as a predictive maintenance activity or predict, pred, predictive uh, obsolescence replacement, etc. Unfortunately, we're at that point yet. We're still um, in the beginning stages of really understanding the way our equipment is is actually performing through our preventive maintenance activities. So we've been transitioned to this new software just you know, probably a year and a half or so. So we're um, we're learning as we go. That is definitely on our radar for us to to develop a predictive maintenance program, but we're we're not there yet. So um, I really have no direct stories to relate to that. We, we, we well, that's actually, probably that's probably probably good so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even even for a, a large university, we're we're sort of in that boat too. We've we've 
probably had 3 million of our 8 million square feet just over the last nine years. And uh, a lot of the systems that would, you know, bring this all into place have just, just are not there yet. So uh, we're, we're, we're working on it. You know, uh, we depend on our building automation system to let us know when equipment is, is and is not working right now. Yeah, I, I uh, wanted to bring the subject uh, maybe a little more towards not, not, not the folks like you who are embracing and facilitating these changes, but the people that it affects. And um, I've, so I've been in the industry for a long time and I've seen technology advance. And um, I've had experiences with staff who are uh, leery about data and technology and what it means to them. Um, some people are intimidated by it. Uh, some people may be afraid it'll, it'll look foolish if they don't understand it. Um, and some people are just, they have the attitude of we've, we've always did it this way. So why are we gonna change now? So, you know, since staff, uh, buy-in from staff is, is, I guess maybe not a key element in, in, in uh, implementing this, uh, th th this big data or collection of big data, but it's certainly a key element in being successful in what you do with it. Um, and, and Fred, I'll, I'll start with you because I mean, you have a pretty big staff and it seems a staff of, of guys who maybe work with mm -hmm. hammers and saws more than, more than technology. And so um, could, you, could you discuss how you have types of challenges you've had with them? Um, how you were able to overcome with it or overcome it and um, and and get everyone kind of moving in a, in a different direction this is actually my second implementation of similar similar operations in the last in the last six years uh, at Logan it was the same way basically we work with from Excel spreadsheets for work orders it was the, there was no system at all and they went from that to maximum it's seven an upgrade five. from napkins <laughs> yeah, right. um, the younger employees uh, the uh, current generation catch on fast. Uh, I think they understand it. They understand the computer age a little better. They don't have a problem with the electronic work orders as much as some of the older tradesmen do. Um, so, and some of the, so the, keeping up, keeping the device with, the simple things like keeping the device with them at all times. Oh, it's going to be a burden. I have to carry it. It's just another tool. It's going to fall on the floor. I'm going to break them. Uh, you know, requiring to prompt work order closure, you know, assuring accuracy of the data when they complete the work, you know, actions taken, concise actions, actions taken. The guys just thought that in, in both places, both times they were feeling that this was just going to add more time. It wasn't going to pull back on the time. And in both cases, and, and the trust end of it too. Uh, a lot of guys think so they're carrying around these, their iPhones and iPads to because we're just following them around now. They want to know, we want to know where they are at all times. Uh, but they came, they came to realize that it made their work easier too. They didn't have to walk back and pick up their work orders. They could complete them right from the field. Their queue of work orders comes up right on the screen. They can prioritize them on their own. Uh, so it's um, both places within a few short months, most I would say 90 plus percent of, of the staffs were, you know, came in line and, and realized the importance of it. And then, uh, and then realized too, that it's a, it's a payroll thing too. The, 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 uh, our systems in the future are going to be linked right with their payroll. They're going to be able to go right on there and see, you know, uh, they're going to go right on there and be able to put their hours in. And it's, it's just a, it's a better system overall. And they come to realize it after a while. Peter? Yeah, <clears throat> so my story is a little different, a lot of similarities, but um, I would say for us transitioning to our new application was really driven by me, but a strong voice from my staff. So I could actually make the argument that my staff were the champions of our transition because the system that we're using prior to this was so difficult and challenging to use, it was frustrating. We were one step away from going to paper napkins or paper, right? <laughs> because we weren't advancing, we were actually Whatever stationary works. or going backwards. Yeah. Um, and so they were coming to me saying, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And so they also, on the flip side, they have to be careful what they ask for. So now we have this new application and now we are able to do a lot of things like tracking their performance, understanding how many work requests are being uh, responded to, what time frame they're being responded to, and creating SLAs to try and uh, really 
tune our, our, our performance to satisfy our customer base. So there's all this information that is now available. Um, and so I think that was, in some respects, a little bit of a light bulb going on for them going, oh, yeah, yeah, this is great, but there's all this now other information. And now we're trying to really work together to see how we can continuously improve the way we actually do our work. So we're, you know, we started out with, uh, you know, a request, um, and now we're at a point where we have a system that's really able to look at actually how we do our work. So, so are they happy with what they wished for? Yes. That's a great story. They, they, they are. Great story. I mean, well, you said that too about they were the champions. That it's the same thing where in the in the situations that I've been in the two implement the implementation. If yeah. you don't if you don't have a dedicated staff, yeah. it's not going to work. And that's that's you know to your point, a very very simple example is that if for them to really deal with any kind of work request, they had to go back to their desk. It was not a mobile application. They couldn't do it any other way. Now they can walk around with an iPhone if they choose, or if they want to use a, an iPad or a, a Google Pad, or they want to bring their laptop, it's totally, totally functional for them and to the, do anywhere they want. The technology is always supported it. There haven't been any gaps in the technology. I know that times people, because uh, we've implemented some of this in, in our properties, and I know guys would say, well, I, you know, I'm in the basement, I can't get the, I can't get the transmission, or I'm up on the roof, or but have you, has the technology supported the application? So technology supported it. I, you know, I will say, you know, some of our property is below ground, and there's cement and steel, and yeah, we have some communication issue with, uh, you know, network connectivity, but if you take that out of the equation, it's been working. So we, we meet one, uh, once a month or once every two months with the supervisors and the foreman, and we have a lessons learned for that last month. What what, how can we enhance the system? What, uh, what is going to work better? What's not working that we can change? So we, we're constantly meeting with the, you know, the, the staff, the six supervisors, and then you know, there's 12 foremen for each department, or one, two foremen for each department, 12 total. And we, we go through, and then they're constantly jotting things down, saying, why can't I do this or I can't do that? Well, both great stories. Chris, I, I guess from, once again, going back, and uh, since you're kind of on, on the other end, uh, in terms of designing and, and 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 once again helping helping people harness this this uh, this data, uh, do you find any naysayers out there on the on on the upper level, the the upper management level, or the that just uh, is it a tough sell sometimes? It, it is it is a tough sell sometimes, um, and, and and I think you know Peter and Fred hit hit the nail on the head when they said you know the adoption of this technology, you know, you're successful when it's it's used and people see the improvements that they can get through their, you know, day-to-day -day work. So when, you know, we're trying to, or when technology is put forward, sometimes people can see it as an obstacle or it's something which is going to uh, eliminate, you know, their role within the organization. Um, but understanding, you know, the process that takes place in their day-to-day -day tasks and what activities they do, and then really overlaying technology onto that is, is really where you kind of have the most success. And um, the, the, they're always going to be near, naysayers there, um, you know, who, who kind of see that big data is kind of the big brother. Um, it's going to, you know, take their take their role. It's going to take their jobs. But I think I think most people see it as is that it's you know taking away the mundane activities, um, so that facility staff can focus on the key high level priorities. And um, so you know, typically in healthcare, so we always say that you know with technology we're going to reduce you know, the kind of um, administrative work so that you can spend more time on patient care and rectifying, you know, high-risk items within a facility. Thank you. Now, I'd like to um, shift the, the, the topic a bit to a, another uh, a topic that's important to me, and I, and I think it's, it's also another way that uh, big data can be used to support our, our industry. Um, so, as, both, uh, I'm a person who's passionate about saving energy, but I also get really excited about upgrading mechanical equipment and so forth, newer technology. And so, you know, someone I've, I've worked in commercial real estate for a while, and I think it's easy for people, you know, not in the industry to see all these shiny, uh, iconic Boston office towers. And um, But the reality is, is that many of these buildings are 40 or 50 years old. Uh, I was talking to a colleague uh, who shared a, a, a was kind of an enlightening fact to me, a colleague from New York. Uh, so the average building in, in New York City is well over 80 years old. So a lot of these buildings have aging mechanical systems and uh, control systems that even to call them legacy would be a compliment. Um, I, I, 
I hope there are no asset managers on this call, particularly not mine, because uh, I, I think we've all experienced difficulty persuading ownership to make investments in upgraded uh, mechanical plants or BAS systems or energy reduction investments, and uh, I guess with good reason, you know, uh, cost. But um, you know, I, wa I wanted to talk about how how this uh, data can 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 help our industry um, identify these these problems and, and maybe um, you know get more more done. Uh, I wanted to start with you, Peter, because in the white paper you told an inter interesting story um, on how you use this data to convince your ex executive team uh, to install solar panels at, at both of your U.S. properties. And uh, first, you know, congratulations. Yeah. And I was wonder if you yep. could uh, expand on that. So certainly. So um, I was fortunate enough to be in a position where this proposal went hand in hand with the objectives of the organization. So. Um, there, there was a sell involved for sure, but it was also one that I think uh, fit, fit right into the, the profile of what our company is trying to do. So, you know, we collect uh, and, and look at our energy use on a monthly basis. Uh, I report it, um, I've been capturing the data and looking at it for, you know, a decade plus since I've been working there. Um, and we use that as a, as a mechanism or a tool to compare see what we could benefit from if we were to find some way to offset some of our energy consumption. So uh, myself, uh, our sustainability coordinator and our CSR director, we've, we formulated a, a plan, uh, put together a presentation to our owner about the transition or the purchase and installation of a solar array on both of our properties to offset a, a portion of our uh, electricity use. Um, and we were successful in that. And one of the overlying factors in this that really worked well for us is our owner is extremely environmentally conscious and wants to do everything in his power to minimize our environmental footprint. And I've been tasked as one of my responsibilities is to reduce our greenhouse gas production 3% year over year forever. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I can do it now. <laughs> but I, 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 years from now, 10 years from now, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to stay at that same pace. But, um, you know, that's the edict that I've been given. And so uh, this dovetailed into one of those 3% greenhouse gas reductions um, and everything fit. You know, numbers fit, energy reduction fit, greenhouse gas reduction fit. And so we were able to make a, a presentation that was received well. And uh, Fred, I, I know uh, Northeastern has, uh, has grown, has some new properties, but there must be some pretty... Um, um, older infrastructure there, and um, do you see this these, this data being able to 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 help with the um, up, upgrade? We for anybody who's driven by through Boston and Northeast, and you see our prototypical buildings that were built from the 40s to the 60s, the white brick buildings with the uh, with the vertical window walls that are just basically old single pane hopper windows that. Uh, not very energy efficient. Uh, we went through a measure a couple of years ago. We went and put a, a, a storm panel inside. Doesn't really help. The kids open the windows anyway uh, and, and leave them open on the coldest days too. And uh, we have an energy unit that's an energy and sustainability unit that's looking to correct that. We, we do have a deferred maintenance project scheduled. Uh, that has that's about twenty million dollars to go and replace those windows with today's better thermal pane windows, uh, and then uh, on the on the other end, even in the newer buildings, we have our building automation systems are in basically nine more than ninety percent of our buildings, even those older dorms, uh, where we do have some issues too is in, in some of the newer labs and and the labs where we shut down the during the summer we shut down the buildings over the weekends to save to save money obviously and to and to reduce our carbon footprint. We'll get a call on Saturday morning from a, a professor who decided to go in the office that day and say, uh, I don't have any air conditioning. And we'll tell them, no, you can't have air conditioning. Or, they have, or they've scheduled a, uh, an event in the building that day. And they didn't let us know. And they go in there and everybody's sweltering. And it's not just a matter of flicking a switch. You can't, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to change your programs and everything else. Well, we are working on that. In fact, another thing Northeastern is moving forward with, we are, we're looking into the construction of a cogeneration plant that is going to uh, move us well into the 21st century. 
Great. Um, so once you, you guys, are, you know, you did the research, you feel confident that you're ready to take take a leap and, and implement a, a new system. Um, and I know we've, we've all talked about it, how successful they've been and, and, and uh, you know, that, that it was all worth doing. But I mean, there was a, a, a comment in the white paper, and it might have come from, from you, Chris, about uh, once you get out there, you can be overwhelmed by the choices of technology that are there, whether it's a new um, computerized maintenance system or a new energy management system. So and I know, uh, you know you guys probably, probably both have a lot on your plate like we all do. And so um, this must have just been another, you know, uh, another, not going to say another task, but another a real uh, time consuming effort. So how daunting was that to go out and, and uh, um, research and, 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 and buy and implement you know, the right system? Uh, was it well, our process, I, I wasn't there when they actually purchased the system. And I, when I came in, one of my first jobs was to implement the system. And what I have discovered, we, what we, like I said, we've had three, probably three million square feet of expansion in, in just the last nine years. What would have helped and what's going to help is that integrated work management system that I talked about earlier that brings into account the real estate management. Uh, capital project management, that includes planning, design, and construction, project management, deferred maintenance, uh, facilities management that has, uh, you know, and during that process have an onboarding system for all new, the, the new components that are, that are, that are coming in, uh, just so that they can be easily commissioned. Uh, facilities management, uh, uh, part of this integrated work management system that has space planning and management, the only two components of the work management system that we have right now are integrated work, are that space planning and work order system. There's a separate construction management uh, program that we use that the design and construction uses that has no real facilities benefit. We're looking to change that by something that has, like I said, real estate, capital project, facilities management, deferred maintenance, commissioning, uh, including asset onboarding and uh, tracking asset life cycles and energy and sustainability. Uh, for campus our size, that's something that uh, that we need. And it's something that uh, I think a lot of people are just beginning to, uh, and, and it also re pro, uh, requires a commitment from upper management that, you know, you don't just add these things to someone's job description. You need a you need staff that's trained in running this type of an operation, running those type of details. Yeah. Um, so for us, uh, you know, I think we had to sit down and really think about where we wanted to be before we actually engaged anybody or looked for any type of application that would satisfy our need. Um, and what we ended up coming up with is that we needed a, uh, or preferred to have an integrated package that manages space as well as, um, I'll say, day-to-day -day maintenance activities. But then on top of that, we were also looking to have, if, if available, to have a application that could grow as we grow and scale as we scale. And so we wanted to have those other suites. We wanted to have sustainability. We wanted to have move management opportunity. We wanted to have project management. We wanted to have real estate management that we don't currently have, but we envision ourselves expanding into these additional applications as the time, time arises. So, we weren't just looking for a standalone CMMS package that just does work requests and preventive maintenance. I needed something that has space and work requests and the opportunity for us to scale. Because um, you can do it the other way. You can buy a separate space management application, you can buy a CMMS application, and you can work with them separately. But we wanted them to talk to each other. We wanted them to be integrated. So that narrowed the field down to some of the bigger players, like what you know, FM Systems, Archibus, mm -hmm. and there's a, a few others. So. That's the way we approached it. I like the way you said that better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, uh, you have anything to add on that? Are you seeing trends or, 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 or what in, in, in terms of um, people you know, confused about, about what, which way they should be going and the options that are out there? Yeah, we, I mean, we do. I mean, we, you know, everyone's looking for you know, whatever they're installing today. They want it to be uh, future proof because you know, in reality, we don't know what that technology is going to be in the next five to ten years. So what we what we definitely see in the industry is, you know, the move, it's definitely shifted away from kind of proprietary systems. But what they're really looking for is a system which is, 
you know, has the ability to interact with other systems. So if you need to install um, a bespoke system somewhere in your facility, you know, you want to be able to connect that to the kind of the enterprise and management system that you have already installed. So interoperability is really is really what's driving the industry today. Uh, you know, focusing on you know open standards for connectivity. Um, you know, backnet um, has always been a good one within the kind of building services field for your your HVAC and all of those systems. But now, as we move more into kind of an IT and an IP level of systems, it's really you know making sure that you have you know web service capabilities and you can you know. You can share data sets, you can share databases, and it's all about making sure that as you move forward in the future, it's future proof so that you can you can scale to us exactly as Peter said. Thank you. Um, it seems like you, you're you're probably more in the minority than um, a lot of people because I think a lot of people do, do purchase uh, like kind of they, I don't see a lot of um, properties that integrate their their, their EMS and you, know, you can have one system that can do everything, you yep. know, uh, security, uh, fire, and the fire monitoring and so forth. And um, so it's a great, great story. Um, yeah, and just j- j- just one comment on that, Wayne. I think I think the the key to it and the key to you know big data and the key to smart facilities, it, it's all about cl- collaboration. So it's, it's collaboration from you know technology providers, um, but it's also collaboration from you know the the operators of that facility. And so that you know they're, they're all working together for a, for a common goal, and and that, that's where we really see um, you know the designs and the buildings and the operations and these new facilities going. You know, I, I uh, saw in the white paper a slide that uh, I found very uh, compelling. It was nationwide. If EMIS best practices were adopted by all target buildings in the U.S. commercial sector. The result could total over four billion dollars in savings. So, um, I think that's light. <laughs> yeah, can we can we talk about that? How do how do we how do we get our in, <clears throat> excuse me our industry and the the decision makers and and to 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 to, to understand this and 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 to to embrace this and and uh, um, stop moving moving in that direction. We 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 we, we have so much uh, limited. Uh, Untapped, limited potential. It seems. And Chris, do you want to? Do you... Yeah, I mean, so, so one of the interesting things that, that we typically see, and it would be good to get kind of Peter and Fred's perspective on this, is um, you know, when when we look at uh, new, new capex buildings or new buildings that are being employed, the, the end users the end users under, understand it. They know exactly you know what their challenges they need to address, but as soon as we move into our traditional um, construction models is where we tend to lose a lot of what the value we're trying to deliver. So unfortunately, what we do see in the industry is that you know, the end user you know, has a vision, it has a mission of what they want to do in terms of their savings, like, like mentioned here. Outdated construction and procurement models is where we, we tend to diminish a lot of the value and you know, we go for cheapest price over, you know, probably the, the more quality of systems. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, we only have about just about 12 minutes left. I had one, just one point I wanted to touch on, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. So I think a lot of our discussion so far uh, has been uh, about very conventional, if you will, technologies that I think that this facility manages, we can all support. You know, they're helpful tools in improving customer service, staff productivity, prolonging equipment life and proactively uh, predicting failures and so forth. Um, but and I think there's a question in here somewhere, but maybe it's an observation. I was talking to a colleague recently, and, and Chris, this may uh, refer back to something you said about people like being um, you know, kind of like big data is, is, is scary. Um, and I was talking to a colleague recently who was a property manager, and they were at a training session, and there was a, uh, a, a, a tech person there and they were talking about new technology and they discussed an app, an app that tracked people's habits, uh, where they where they went to lunch, where they shopped, and that potential landlords could then use this information as marketing um, if they had these amenities in their building or in their area. And I asked the woman, uh, uh, did, did they say whether these people volunteered for this? And she said, you know what, 
I, I, I don't really know. And so I, I guess the question, and somewhere in here, there is a question, um, you know, as professionals on the leading edge of embracing new technology and the data that comes with it, I mean, do you have any concerns uh, uh, that collection data could be too invasive? Or quite frankly, it could, can sometimes it, it not be a good thing? I mean, there may be organizations that for whatever reason might not want particular data exposed. So could someone, con um, would you like to, I don't know who wants to yeah. take that, but it's kind of a, a loaded question, but uh, it's, the cynic, it's the cynic in me, we'll yeah. say. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll, I'll take that take that one, Wayne, because I, I think what, what we're seeing in, and, you know, this relates to what we're seeing over in Europe is, you know, we're going through the a new regulation, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. And this is what, what that's all about. It's, you know, what type of information can you share about, um, you know, a person uh, to be able to use that information, whether it's for marketing, whether it's for optimizing facilities, but how do you as an individual um, give approval for that data to be used? So we're seeing we're seeing a lot of regulations and a lot of discussions taking place, um, which you know it could impact a lot of what's happening with kind of IoT technology and big data technology, you know. But in the US, it's, it's similar to kind of your your data protection and your your health information systems or you know your HIMSS regulations, where it's really saying how do we protect that information for the for the individual. So it, I think it's a huge discussion at the moment. I don't think there's a clear consensus on the direction of that heading. Okay. So I can say we're, we're doing the exact same thing. We're, we're dealing, you know, we have a active project. And I would think that both, 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 both of yep. you, Peter and Fred, your organizations uh, would maybe be um, more, more concerned about that than a commercial office property yep. you know, where, where their tenants are going to lunch. But you, you folks may have more, more, um, more data that's, that's, that that's, should be protected. So yep. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I nope, just wanted that, to. That's it. I just was echoing exactly what Chris said. We're doing the same thing. Right. Same in the same here. It's just a it, it, it's it's a it's a double edged sword. I, I I bought a new Jeep the other day on a different sub. I got a new Jeep back in February, and this is obviously has nothing to do with Northeastern. The other day I got an email telling me it had my the mileage that I've driven. It had uh, it had the tire pressure. It had all the data about my car. It was just a Jeep Cherokee, and it came in an email to me, and I'm like, "That's scary." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, do they know where I've driven? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, on that note, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd really like to open it up. Uh, we we just have a few minutes left, about seven minutes, and uh, if anyone has any questions, we'd certainly like to hear from you. Do I unmute them? anybody has any questions, they can just type right in yeah, please, the uh, dialog box. If you have any questions, type it in the dialog box. <laughs> That's, um, that was you. All right. All right, well, uh, I want to thank everyone who joined, and uh, Chris, for, thank you for joining from Brazil. It's it's not an ungodly hour there, I hope. <laughs> no, it's only one hour ahead, so it's, it's good. Okay. It's been a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank Welcome. you, Fred. Thank you. And um, once again, thanks to all who joined, and uh, hope this was a informative session. And um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Right. Here's a week to just stay in the hall and I was part of it. If you quit, I should ask. If you quit, leave them. Let's see, hold on. Let's choose another. webinar for all.